of Thessaloniki and they are in close collaboration with the European Union Youth Orchestra. They, are also have, they have also presented in various unexpected public spaces and they are also starting to, to play with schools. I have witnessed uh, a recent performance by them in Thessaloniki and I was really impressed by the results already uh, accomplished because at the, fi the final piece of the concert uh, it was conducted by, I believe, a 12-year-old boy, so congratulations. Um, the Underground Youth Orchestra, they've been active since 2012. Um, they have run also, they have appeared in various venues. They have uh, held a concert for the Winter uh, Olympic Games ceremony, flame lighting ceremony in 2014, as well as for the Greek Parliament. Uh, but what I like most is that they travel along the country and they try to expand their educational work. They organize seminars together with the children, the music students in, uh, this, in these cities and they organize also common concerts, concerts there. Um, and also, I think that this is also nice to know, uh, the first ever event, the first ever performance in the Stavros Nyarchos Park, in the Stavros Nyarchos Foundation Cultural Center, uh, this past uh, Sunday was held by the Underground Youth Orchestra. So thank you for this. Um, thank you to both for this nice performance and I guess uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. And we are on to the afternoon sessions of our first day. So for this part of the conference, we are very happy to have with us three exceptional individuals and speakers who will each deliver a 15 to 20 minute TED-like talk. We will start off with Gary Kasparov, the chairman of the Kasparov Chess Foundation, on gaming techniques and sustainable education. Then, Pierre-Yves Cousteau, the CEO and founder of Cousteau Divers, will talk about innovation and sustainability. And last but not least, Mr. Renzo Piano, architect, Renzo Piano Building Workshop, and the architect of the Stavros Narcos Foundation Cultural Center, will talk about a place for people. We would like to invite to the stage Mr. Gary Kasparov to deliver the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Many thanks for Stavros Nyarkos Foundation for inviting me and also for supporting uh, one of the largest chess uh, in-school programs uh, run by Kasparov uh, Chess Foundation it's here in Greece. It's, uh, hopefully it will become a European model just to tell people outside of Greece that this country can provide not only trouble but also a positive view for the future. Um, just to start, you know, as a middle introduction, I know it's a short talk, but still I couldn't uh, um, avoid show, sharing the picture that is 40 years old. Um, it's 1975, and I'm 12 years old, uh, and with my uh, great teacher, former world champion, Mikhail Batvinik. And uh, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, when you look at these pants, that Soviet chess was way ahead of Soviet fashion. Um, um, Chess education has changed completely in the last 30 years. And, uh, you know, as everywhere, you know, we had a teacher, and the uh, teacher was the only source of information, and we had to listen, we had to learn, and uh, you know, there were very limited sort of movements for, 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 for a student. We memorized and accepted everything. So it's the same as in, you know, in traditional education in, in, in other subjects. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to show, you know, how the game of, uh, game of chess has changed 
and what actually could be how this experience can be used to address the challenges of, of the education of the 21st century, how to make it sustainable. Because just imagine for a moment that you, um, uh, you have a time traveler who just jumps from 1915 to 2015. I think this person will be almost paralyzed by the great changes. He or she will not recognize anything except one thing, the classroom. If he or she walks into the classroom, it's still the same. You may have, of course, you know, better desks, you know, computers there. But at the end of the day, it's still teacher in the front row, you know, talking to the students, and they are just, you know, listening to him, and it's still one-way street, which is amazing because we live in an interactive world. And those kids, we may call them iPad generation, they used to, to, be, to do everything, you know, in an interactive fashion which you may call as a two-way street. Um, so education must reform and evolve to keep up with the challenges of the, of the modern world. And I will start sharing my chess experience and to show how it, I believe, could, be, uh, could benefit uh, education in general. Um, I uh, started in 2002, Casper of Chess Foundation in, in, in New York. Now there are five of them in Brussels. Uh, Europe, Africa, Johannesburg, Singapore, Asia Pacific, and the Mexico Ibero-American. Um, and it's, again, it's, it for me was a very important uh, move forward because I wanted to, my legacy, chess legacy, not to be just at the chess board, but also to bring chess to, uh, to the main, uh, uh, main area of, of, uh, of education. And the reason I believed, you know, it would work because we already collected enough data to show the benefits of the game of chess for, for, for education. And um, you can, it, there's some of them. It's, uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't uh, spend too much time here uh, telling you about all the benefits, but trust me that these results have been uh, uh, proven in different quarters. And if you receive the same results from New York, uh, uh, any European country, I mean, Estonia, Greece, uh, uh, Germany, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Asian countries. So that tells you something about the quality of, of the game of chess as a potential educational tool. And this is what I want to emphasize. We do not want to teach chess in the classroom as the game. Of course, if we find another Bobby Fischer or Gary Kasparov, nobody's going to say no. But, but the, first of all, it's a tool. It's a tool to help kids to meet the challenges of modern education. And there are two key areas where we believe you know, we can make the difference. First of all, we're dealing with kids from you know, challenging socioeconomic areas, from an uh, you know, underprivileged world, where you know, they have to you know, learn elementary things before actually learning in, in, in the classroom. And on the other side, we will have kids from advanced countries, kids with computers, and there are different kinds of challenges. And I'll show you quickly how we can, um, we can uh, bring chess into helping us to solve these problems. First of all, I would like to share, you know, um, a little bit of, you know, just this of my African experience. It's a very short uh, video, just less than two minutes, and I give you an idea of, of one side of the problem, the world when, where our foundation has been operating. Excuse me. I know machines hate me, but... <laughs> to specifically correct early childhood developmental fallout areas. You will see while the children are playing, while they're doing this program and enjoying it, they're building self-confidence. We encourage them to communicate with their opponents, with their co-players, so that they, over the borders of cultural barriers or language, age or gender, even physical ability. This program, while the children are having fun, they have to make personally responsible decisions about the moves they're going to make. It also develops managerial skills. This video introduces you to Kagoma Gate, which is um, the forgotten village in the sugarcane fields of Uganda. Two years ago, before the school was built, not a single person in this village could read or write. We started with a mini chess program there, and the adults 
are attending the classes with the children. While this community are learning to read and write and do basic mathematics, they are enjoying and having fun together, playing together. Five of these learners were invited a few months ago to Kampala for the launch function of this project. And for the first time in their lives, they wore shoes. The first time in their lives, they saw buffet meals. So, flash immunities. And they played chess against their hero, ex-world champion, Gary Kasparov. So, um, the challenges in this part of the world is that these kids, you know, have to understand things like up and down, right and left. I mean, it just before you teach them basics, you know, uh, in the classroom, they have to sort of like you have to open a gate for, 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 for education. And uh, what we found out that through this, you know, gaming interaction, you can solve many problems, including, you know, a dramatic drop of the absentee rate. Because for many kids in this part of the world, to go to the school, to reach the school is a challenge. They have to walk a few miles and uh, the transportation there is a problem. So you have to attract them, you have to bring them in. They do not have the same experience as kids in Europe or America or many Asian countries where education has become sort of an integrated part of our society. They have to understand that education, which was never part of their family history, is important for them. So you have to attract them. You have to bring them something that makes them feel excited. And this program called Mini Chess uh, developed in, in, in South Africa and we have successfully been introducing it to many African countries, works, you know, works with these kids and makes them feel happy. They suddenly feel that they can make sort of a successful entry in the world of education. And you know, um, that also boosts uh, their confidence. So that's one side of the picture. Now we can move to just a more fortunate part of the world. Uh, that's a um, se session of Casper of Chess Foundation in New York City, uh, in very sophisticated office, as you can see. All kids with computers. Those are, you know, it's, uh, the kids, the, the, the best kids in the country, in the United States. Uh, it's so-called the Young Star programs that uh, we're doing also uh, outside, you know, our, our main, the main area of the blueprint um, uh, curricula. Um, and of course, you know, all kids are working with computers. So it's very important that, you know, we establish this kind of communication. And that's, you know, I'm going back to this, you know, to this, you know, role of a teacher. So uh, um, you have to build a bridge. You have to make sure the kids, you know, receive information, um, you know, and they can ask you questions. They can even challenge you. Um, okay. And uh, hopefully you can, you can meet this challenge. Uh, but in chess, we learned it. Because what's happening in, in the game of chess over the um, um, last 30 years was you know, quite a significant change. From computers being um, fairly weak, in 1985 I played a simultaneous exhibition in Hamburg against 32 chess portable computers. I'm sure many of them could have it at home, so that's, that's old fashioned, and I beat all of them. So nowadays, uh, chess engine on, on, on your laptop will beat probably every strong, every strong player, including a world champion Magnus Carlsen. So this is a dramatic change, but it also means that chess players, professional chess players, had to adopt uh, to um, change the way they prepare for the game. And those who couldn't make it, they just, you know, they disappeared quickly from the rating list. Um, some of them, you know, like Vish Anand, the former world champion, he's uh, in mid-40s now. I mean, he did well and he's still there. So it's again, it's it's never never late to learn. But again, you have to make sure you can adopt. And uh, we have this experience in chess, which we can bring to the classroom. And that's that's what's important. Um, sustainable 21st century skills. So what what we should do in the classroom? Empower kids by teaching them skills to acquire information, and not giving information to memorize. Use competition and social cooperation. That's what you could see in, 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 in the, um, in our, from our chess experience to engage students and teach them to collaborate on solving new problems. So in chess, each position is a new problem to solve. And the challenges, they always increase. So you need to succeed, you need different methods, different results, and requires both objective and creative analysis. So those are the problems that will decide whether these, our students um, 
will be successful or not in the 21st century, in this very competitive environment of the 20, 21st century. Um, and uh, it again brings us, again brings us back to the role of a teacher. So teacher still remains the only, the sole source of authority and information. But the problem is that information is available to everyone. Uh, sliding a finger on a screen, a kid could learn probably more than a teacher have learned throughout his or her life. Uh, just sharing information is not enough. And actually, just it, it could um, kill the appetite for kids to, uh, to, 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 to study further because they don't see the difference between a, acquiring information in the classroom and what they can do on the screen. But those are the, you know, those are the challenges um, that we have to meet. So teachers and schools today must impart skills. It's about skills. There's so much information available, but how to navigate, how to make sure the kids will, will use it productively and uh, will you know, we'll do something new. So we'll have to encourage them not to look for answers on the computer screen, but to ask questions, which is quite difficult and it's quite challenging. Pablo Picasso once said that computers are useless because they can only give you answers. And actually, I have to say that you know, this paradox reflects the biggest problem of modern education uh, and probably the, the business world in general. Because we, we believe that everything we need we'll find on the screen. But if we want to be competitive, if we want to have a competitive edge, we have to come up with new ideas. And new ideas come only after asking right questions. That's at least 50% of success. So um, traditional education has a competitive imperative to reform and evolve. But of course, it's relatively slow and it's, it's hard to see. So it means more production of ideas more efficiently and more quickly. It means attracting the best students and workers, building an information economy. But it's just as clear that those who fail to change will lose to those who change first. The schools, the cities, the countries that adapt dynamic new methods to teach sustainable skills will win. And in this game, quote unquote, game of education, winning means a better standard of living, a better life. And uh, we hear it time and again. Some say education is too important, too important to make big changes. It must be conservative because changes could uh, uh, be, could have a negative impact. We have, we have to take time to, uh, find out whether we need to make one tiny step and we need tons of tests before we make it. Yes, I agree, change means risk. And that means that we do not know the outcome. But the truth is that the education is too important not to take risk, not to make changes. If we do not change, if we do not meet the challenges of the 21st century in our classrooms, I guess we all know the outcome. It's the interactive world. We have to move. Yes, there will be mistakes made, no doubt about it, but that's a chance. That's a chance that will create this living environment where, by the way, kids will also teach us a lot because they know much better how to operate with these computers. I mean, I wouldn't compete with my eight-year-old daughter, you know, when she takes an iPad. But definitely I can help her or other kids uh, to navigate through this information and to make sure that you know, they will use it productively because we have our experience. So it's, the, it's, a, it's an environment that will put more challenges on our side because it's a new world, it's a brand new world, it's a brave new world uh, in positive terms and uh, we have to find a way to share our experience, to actually merge our experience, uh, our knowledge of how to deal with this experience how to navigate through the information with the ability of kids to, uh, to move forward and to make, to make changes. Um, it will be an essential investment in the future. Yeah, and um, uh, I just wanted to uh, just have a, a just final um, example is that uh, in 1969, when Americans landed on the moon, the entire computing power of NASA was size of one, this device. The entire computing power and they could manage it. Now, when people say, oh, it's, this, 
it's too difficult now because you know everything has been already you know found out uh, the, all the big discoveries have been made just imagine that our kids they have such a powerful device in their hands the problem is that this device also you know uh, gives them temptation to do other things like sharing pictures or gossips so it's for us to actually move them in the right direction and to make sure that you know with such a huge power of, in, the, in their hands, they will look up to the space. They will open new worlds. They will create uh, uh, new uh, uh, areas of um, unknown. Uh, and uh, they will make this world better. And uh, I would like to thank again Star Wars Foundation for uh, you know, uh, initiating this debate. And, uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, move forward with these ideas. And uh, let's go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasparov. We looked up into space, and now we invite you to dive down to look into what lies underwater. So we would like to ask Pierre-Yves Cousteau to come up on the stage and share his insights about innovation and sustainability. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for having me here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and, uh, and an honor. I love Greece, I love to be back here. And I have to say it's a particular honor to be uh, speaking after Mr. Gary Kasparov and to be part of this panel because, uh, uh, so I, you know, during my talks I usually say, I learned to dive when I was nine years old and that's you know, one of the activities I've done for the longest amount of time. But actually, um, chess is something I've done for a lot longer. Since I was seven years old, my father taught me how to play chess and uh, Mr. Kasparov has been a, a role model uh, in many ways, so um, it's really an honor, sorry. Anyways, <clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about innovation and sustainability. And um, this is my father, Jacques Cousteau. I'm sure you guys are familiar with, uh, with his work. A lot of people say, wait, he's your grandfather. No, 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 he's my father. Um, so I'm living proof that scuba diving is really good for your health. And uh, I don't know, are there any scuba divers here in the room? Yeah, I see a few hands, yes. Those are some happy married people. Happily married, I'm sure those are happy, healthy couples. Anyways, um, so that's my sister there. And um, my father uh, took me diving when I was nine years old and I've been hooked ever since. He uh, invented scuba diving, actually, and paved the way for marine biology, marine ecology, oceanography, uh, revolutionized a lot of these different fields of science by inventing a simple uh, apparatus for his intents and purposes, which was making movies, as you can see, he was doing it with a lot of style. He also invented houses under the sea, saturation diving, proving that humans could live and work underwater for extended periods of time, which opened the way for offshore engineering and the developments that that has brought to society as well. One of his last inventions before he died in 1997 was the turbosail technology, which is a revolutionary hybrid wind propulsion that can save fuel on naval transportation. And I'll get back to that in a little while. But I'm not just my father's son. I've also got my experience that I'm here to share with you today. And I've worked with uh, Berkeley doing genetic biocoding on the island of Morea and ethnopharmacology. I've worked with NASA in the Atacama Desert looking for uh, origins of life uh, in astrobiology, looking for microbial organisms in the driest place on Earth. It rains every 11 years in these places. I've worked for the European Space Agency, uh, coordinating biology experiments that are flown into the International Space Station. I've created Custo Divers, a worldwide network of divers and dive centers united to study and protect marine life. I recently attended INSEAD, a business school, because I realized that conservation alone and good feelings are not enough to get the needle moving as fast as we need it to go if we want to survive um, on this planet. And I created the Environment and Business Club because when I got to INSEAD, I realized these guys don't know anything about sustainability and they don't really care. So I, I tried to bring that in to raise awareness of the students of INSEAD, who are the future business leaders of the world, to sustainability issues and to how environment and business can be mixed together. 
Last year, I tried to commercialize the TurboSail technology by applying it to bulk carriers and um, uh, uh, tankers. Uh, this technology can save about 15, 20% fuel uh, with the correct wind conditions. It's a 30-year-old technology, and still today, it's the most efficient uh, wind propulsion technology. That, that failed because of the oil price crash in September last year. Uh, of course, the economic incentive to install these kind of technologies suddenly vanished, or at least was pushed back by several years. So now I work for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, which is the oldest and largest uh, non-governmental organization for uh, protecting nature. And I work on several topics that range from influencing cultural values in Europe to foster environmental stewardship, to devising new financial products to allow investments in conservation. But my real passion is diving. And uh, sometimes I do it with a little bit of a cosplay thing going on. Um, and I've been very fortunate as a diving instructor to travel the world and to witness a lot of its beauty, a lot of the incredible creatures, the incredible um, sites and landscapes that you can get underwater that you can see nowhere else, and I'm happy to share them with you here today. But I quickly realized, okay, this is beautiful, but it's degrading at an alarming pace. How are we going to protect this for the future? So I created Custo Divers five years ago, which is an NGO um, that basically um, unites a community of divers and dive centers to help study and protect marine life through citizen science. That means that we ask people to report their observations, recreational divers, very simple observations, photos, videos, dive logs, and that will help us make a near real-time diagnostic of the health of the ocean in the hopes of acting like an immune system when problems arise. So the methods originally were an underwater slate, they evolved to a post-dive dive log, and now we're moving towards mobile applications, of course. And thanks to the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, we moved beyond studying the ocean to protecting it by this pilot project in Santorini in Greece where I became a dive instructor, which is close to my heart. Uh, here with the Hellenic Center for Marine Resources, we basically uh, are trying to create a marine protected area. Marine protected areas are very simple. It's a place where you stop fishing, you stop any destructive activity. And by doing that, you let re nature recover. And when nature recovers, there's also spillovers. So suddenly you have fish, but you're not, you're not endangering the, the, the capital. So we did a baseline scientific study of the marine life in, in Santorini. We came up with management plans. Um, with the best practices, and most important of all, because this approach is, is, is a bit innovative and different in the sense that it's not a government saying, hey, now you can't fish here, it's finished, we have to do it, it's good for the environment. This is different. We came, we, we came to Santorini, we spoke with the fishermen, we spoke with the dive masters, we spoke with the hotels and restaurants, the scientists, the politicians, we spoke with everyone and tried to build consensus so that the project would come from the bottom up, so that the people would understand that it's in their interest to conserve nature and to create these sanctuaries um, and that they would th therefore become the champions of it. Thereby stimulating very different values, cultural values inside the Santorini community than we would have if it had been a top-down approach. And I'll get back to that in a little while. So right now my work at IUCN uh, involves, as I was mentioning earlier, um, several different things. And one of them, can we please have the video? is um, this um, Catlin Seaview project on which, of which we are a partner. The Catlin Seaview is a, a very interesting project. You can see this device that's tracked by a, a, an underwater scooter. It's a camera. It has three cameras that shoot at very wide angles. So you get a 360 degree photo of um, the underwater environment. And you can check it out online. It's on underwater uh, Google Street View, basically. Um, and so you can do virtual dives. So for all of you who didn't raise your hands about being a diver, you can just, you know, open your laptop and go diving that way. Of course, you won't get wet. Okay, you can, I suppose you can do it in the shower, but that, that's a little more complicated. Um, and what's really, th there's a couple of innovative things about this I want to I dwell on a little bit. First off, the camera that's pointing downwards uh, takes pictures of the, the benthos, so of the benthic communities that live on the substrate. And um, they have uh, developed at the Scripps Institute a algorithm in which they process these images so that they can automatically recognize which species are present and they can deduct what is the health of the site. Also, because they're tracted by a scooter, you can cover two kilometers in one hour in one dive, whereas traditional scientists lay out these transects, as you can see here, and in one hour they can do at best one or 200 meters. 
Um, so the scale has changed. And now with this kind of technology, we can assess the health of the environment, uh, make baselines much more efficiently and probably worldwide in a, in a reasonable time frame. I'm not going to put on the whole video because I'm going to have a little bit of a time constraint. But so uh, this graph shows the state of uh, different, um, different problems, basically, that, that we've got ourselves in as a species. This is a 2009 graph. I apologize. It's old. Uh, but the situation has just gotten worse since. Um, basically, you can see climate change, huge issue right now. It's a hot topic. Everyone's talking about it acidification of the ocean, also the nitrogen cycle, and the rate at which we are losing biodiversity, the extinction of species. Um, now this rate, the current rate of extic extinction of species is equivalent or even higher than the rate of extinction that we had when the meteorite killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So we are today the meteorite, that's us. And we're having that same impact on, on, on life. So what can we do about it, and why should we do something about it? Um, well, first off, I, I want to you know, let you think about why we would protect nature. Do we need it? Do we need this guy? Do we need this nudibranch? Do we need um, you know, these beautiful coral reefs? Well, one of the values that they provide to us is beauty, of course. When you go on vacation, you go to the mountain, you go to the countryside, you go to the sea, you need nature to feel human. You need nature to regenerate. And that is one of the services that's very hard to quantify that nature provides to us. Now, there are other services that nature, nature provides to us. And this is an example of these services. Uh, this is Posidon Posidonia Oceanica. It's a seagrass. It's endemic to the Mediterranean Sea. You can only find it here. And what it does is basically it takes the CO2 out of the water and stores it in its root mats. And the Hellenic Center for Marine Resources recently uh, released a publication saying that it's estimated that the Mediterranean seagrass has captured 40% of all the CO2 that all the Mediterranean countries have emitted since the Industrial Revolution. So you can imagine the, the, the phenomenal eco ecosystem services that this, is, this plant is providing to us. Another ecosystem service, you may not be aware, you might be aware, but half of the oxygen you're breathing right now is produced by the oceans. We always talk about um, the Amazonian rainforest, that's great, that's half of it, or the forest in general. The other half is in the oceans. It's these guys. They're beautiful too. It just so happens when you look at them under a scanning electron microscope. And they produce half of the, uh, half of the oxygen that you're breathing right now. Another very important ecosystem service that the oceans provide is food. The oceans feed one billion people on our planet. One out of seven humans is fed by the oceans. And we've already lost in the past 100 years 90% of all fish in the oceans because of overfishing. So I can only let you imagine the consequences, the social consequences, the political consequences, the economic consequences of one billion people going without livelihood one day to the next. Although it's not one day to the next, it takes a little, couple of years, of course. But. And you don't even need to imagine. Look what's happening at the borders of Europe. People are coming in. I'm, I'm not going to say this is the only cause for North African immigration to Europe. That would be foolish. But it is definitely an important cause. These North African countries, they've, they've been living on fisheries for millennia. Suddenly, a super trawler comes by, takes all the fish, they have nothing to eat. And, and they don't come back, the fish, because the super trawlers come back. So all these people, all of a sudden, they don't have livelihoods. And they stack up on these little boats and they try to make a living somewhere. Because we've taken everything they've got, basically. So you can see here the social impact, the social consequences of environmental um, actions, environmental inactions. And you can see how the two are linked and how often environmental causes um, are upstream from the social consequences. People protect what they love is a very famous quote from my father. And I think he said it around 1970s or 1980s, probably before I was born. Um, let's look at it a little more in depth. What does that mean, people protect what they love? It, it, it refers to the values. If you look at um, sustainability and... Um, the environment, environmental movements in the 70s and the 80s, they were very passionate. They were all about protecting nature because of our moral duty as a superior species, as a dominant species on this planet. That's not true, we're not the dominant species. We all know that cats are in fact the dominant species. But they don't seem very concerned about the environment, so we're gonna have to leave it up to us. Um, so there is this, this notion of moral obligation to conserve nature. Because we're the dominant species, there's no life anywhere else in the universe for as far as we know. 
So, you know, are we the environmental stewards of this planet? Do we have a moral duty to conserve life? And today, the debate has shifted a little bit because these environmentalists, although they made a lot of noise in the 70s and 80s, unfortunately, did not get, manage, to, manage to change things as we saw the 1992 Rio summit, the great declarations and everything, nothing changed. So today the discussion is looking more because now we're realizing that we're starting to saw the branch on which we're sitting. Now the question isn't about our moral obligation, now the question is our survival, is our well-being. And that touches a lot more people, and touches businesses. Our whole societies, our economies are based on natural capital. Our health is, our well-being is. So now the question is, how do we protect ourselves? How are we going to achieve this? Well, uh, this is a report by the WWF uh, with uh, the Boston Consulting Group uh, that was um, recently, recently published as well. Very interesting. That shows an attempt of quantifying the ecosystem services, estimating that the, the oceans produce a value of $24 trillion annually, placing them on the seventh spot of, um, of uh, GDPs worldwide between uh, UK and Brazil if the oceans were a country. And that's, it's a very interesting approach to try to quantify, to try to incentivize businesses to say, hey, you've got an opportunity here. You know, this is a business opportunity to be sustainable. It's not just charitable. So again, keep in mind the two reasons. Why do we do what we do? Are we doing it for the moral obligation? Are we doing it because it's convenient and there's money to be made? Those are two different approaches. And that's what the World Ocean Summit was about as well um, just a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in Lisbon where businesses and NGOs came together to discuss blue growth and the future of the oceans. And the World Bank published a very interesting report um, where they said that if we reduce by 50% our fishing efforts, we will increase our profits by 80 billion. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? Reduce fishing, more, more money. And this, this graph kind of explains why. Um, the maximum sustainable yield, which you can see in the middle, is basically the most you can catch without harming the species, without harming nature. But the maximum econo economic yield is the maximum you can catch to maximize your profit, so reducing your effort, uh, making your effort more efficient. So there's a huge opportunity here to make money, to, to um, revolutionize management of fisheries worldwide, and that's just one example of the ecosystem services. And this cr leads to the possibility of creating new financial products, and this is what I'm doing now at IUCN, looking at how we can create new financial products to invest in nature so that we can drive the financial industry, drive um, the major industries into conservation, making it in their interest, making money out of protecting nature. Now, I'm almost done, and um, I just, you know, I came here, obviously, I realized that uh, Greece is in a very bad uh, debt situation, and uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say I have a solution to that, but this is a very old trick um, that countries, developing countries, can trade their debt for nature. It's called a debt for, uh, debt for nature swap. It's, a, it's an old instrument that was never used for very large amounts of money. Um, but basically the idea is that the country can trade its debt in exchange for promising to protect, or not just promising, but actually enforcing protection of its natural capital. And um, you can find this on Wikipedia, by the way. Don't, uh, don't need to take a picture with your phone. Um, and basically if we apply this to Greece, I mean, the debt is so big that Greece would become a Jurassic Park, um, <laughs> which, you know, I don't know. Actually, that might not, that might not even that might not even solve the problem. But anyways, just a, just a thought, a nugget, a nugget of thought. I'm almost done here. I just want to finish with these last couple of last two slides. First off, I want to say, you know, life on Earth has been present for over 3.8 billion years. It's going to be present for another few billion years. It's gone through several major extinction events. We're creating one now. Um, but we are no matter how hard we try to destroy life on Earth. We will not manage to exterminate life on Earth. And what we're doing is we're actually jeopardizing our survival on this planet. So if, even if, if we don't manage to make it as a species, well, life on Earth will come back. It'll new species, new forms, recolonize the biosphere, and, um, and life will, will go on. So it's, a, it's important to understand, again, this question of why we protect nature. Why do we do what we do? And there are two fundamentally opposed, but uh, complementary in their actions. Uh, philosophies. One philosophy is we protect nature because of our moral obligation, because of self-transcending values. This is a map of values, by the way, how they correlate between them. That means that if you activate one of these values, 
the others are also activated. This is used a lot in social psychology, in marketing, in politics. They use this against you, so to speak, to manipulate you. Um, and to, make you, to sell you more things or to make you agree to, to laws and things like this. Well, today, social sciences and marketing are turning to environmental studies and seeing how we can apply this knowledge that was gained to changing the values of society in order to make us good environmental stewards. So are we doing it out of moral obligation? Or are we doing it for our personal financial success? And I think that even if, and I, I hope that we will do it out of our moral obligation, to be honest, and this is just me, it's just my opinion, but that doesn't mean we can't make money doing it. It's just saying, why are we doing it? And that's important. It may not seem important, but it does instill values throughout society. So do we want to keep reinforcing those, those you know, extrinsic, self-centered values, even while conserving nature? Or do we want to try to move to something more humanistic, more universal, while making money? So on that, I thank you for your attention, and um, I wish you a rest of uh, a uh, good afternoon. <clears throat>
It's a building for 10,000 people, and we only have 40 parking spaces. And the reason is very simple, because everybody moves on public transportation. This building is sitting on London Bridge Station. We have a two subway. We have a 20 bus station. We have a, a six uh, train line. So architecture is about that. This is the California Academy of Science in San Francisco. It's a building that is a platinum in the lead system. It's a science museum. The roof is made of under 50,000 of those little things. So it's a vegetable roof. We have no air conditioning in that building. So you don't freeze. <laughs> Architecture is also about people, making place for people. This is a very simple job. I've been for 15 years member of UNESCO as a goodwill ambassador. This was working on historical center. This is again Bobur. That was uh, only three years after May 68 in Paris. We were young bad boys. And uh, what we got to do was to, to say clearly that the cultural place must be open, accessible, not intimidating. They should be machine, I'm not sure, but something different from marble monument. Place for people. Making place for people is, is a serious job. And this is in Rome. It's the auditorium in Rome, music here. Yeah. Again, creating place where people come and they stay together. They built the sense of tolerance and coexistence that is essential to the civic life in cities. Architecture is also about art, of course. It's about sound. Here we are inside the big concert, concert hall in Rome. This is about sound. This is about breeze. Here we are in the middle of nowhere, in the Pacific Ocean. This is a center for the Kanaki. The Kanaki are one of the three big ethnics in the Pacific, like Maori, like Aborigines. And those buildings have, have a sound. They play with, with the breeze. It's also about light. This is the Menil Collection in Houston. So architecture is about construction, it's about people, it's about society, community, it's also about poetry. It's about looking for emotion. Emotion comes from art, from sound, from, from light. This is Harvard Art Museum in Cambridge. Boston is a recent job, and this again is the last job we have just opened in, in New York, is the Whitney, the Whitney Museum of American Art, is a building downtown. Again, is a building where accessibility is the key word. Now, I'm talking about this because I wanted to stress one thing, that somebody believed that architects are people giving shape academic shape, some, sometimes happens like that, but oh, they select the colors. But it's actually the art of making building and making cities. And making building, public building in cities is very important because w this is what makes city place to live and to stay. Now, this is the reason why I'm so proud, I'm so happy, so touched by doing this job here in Athens, the Stavros Nearchos Foundation. This is the place, it's a big site, it's about 20 hectare site, and it's a big park. The park was partially open this week. People came, it's a great joy, it's a great joy, because finally you can see the face of people, and, use, and this is a great compensation for the architect. And the, the idea is very simple. You know, where we are here, we are in Kalitea. Kalitea means beautiful view. And the beautiful view came from watching the sea. But now, if you go there, you don't see anymore the sea. Because the, the highway came and all the, the, all the building. So the idea was very simple. We made that park. The park goes up gently from the bottom to the top to up to 30 meters. And the buildings are actually underneath the park. They are not under the, on the ground. It's the ground that goes up. It's a very simple idea. You go up, and when you reach the top of the park, you discover the sea again. You have again the Calitea. I don't want to make a long story about this, because 
in one year time the building will be finished and architects should never explain what they do they should just do it and shut up but anyway a few things i mean this building is about the sense of lightness is of course the place for people but you all know this building is a park but it's also a library a public library state library is it's, it's an opera house it's also concert place we have an agora we have everything we need to, to create a civic place but also this thing that you can see up flying above ground is 100 meters by 100 meter sun capital well you may think funny idea to make a sun capital well that makes sense in athens where you need shadow <laughs> and you need to create a good and and this is what uh, in, uh, in old Greek was called elaphrotis, the sense of light, the sense of fly. And what I'm trying to say, let's see, if, no, this is the site, one of the most incredible sites you can think about. And I can spend hours here talking about sustainability. Those are the pumps that we use to pump water for irrigation. And then we give back the water to the, to the to the water table. This is the roof creating energy from the sun. And this energy is almost enough. We are very close to zero emission because this is almost enough to feed the building when the building is not active. I mean, when the building is just, uh, just breathing. And this is also very important. It's about energy. And it's also, this is another view, when you approach the building, you have a, you have a canal, 400 meters long, so we found water where water was already. You go up on the park, as you can see on the right of the picture, and then when you reach that point up there, you see, the, you see again the sea. You are up enough, 30 meters in Athens is enough to see everything. You turn your head back and you see Athens. You, you watch south and you see the sea. And, that, and this is, is part of the argument about sustainability. You know, of course, buildings must be sustainable. They must be wise. But they also need to invent a new language. Because this is the most important inspiring element of this century, is the fragility of Earth. So in some way, as an architect, Instead of looking at styles or fashions, we should really look to the force of necessity. And the force of necessity, you can be transported easily in poetry. I'm pretty sure about that. And actually innovation, but even in terms of language, is so much related to the force of necessity. It's been through all the history. The 19th century invented the lightness by making buildings in steel. Chicago was rebuilt in steel. So this idea that in some way sustainability is a, is a necessity, but it's also something that helped to create a new language for architecture, I'm pretty sure. And uh, this is something I have to say because uh, this is Mediterranean Sea. We talk a lot about that. I'm Italian. I grew up in Genoa, here we are in Athens. If you look at this sea, you realize it's not really a sea, it's a lake. It's a big lake. And in the middle of that lake, you have two countries that came to enjoy life. And those are Greeks and Italy. You can see. <laughs> it's absolutely clear. <laughs> And that's why I don't understand people thinking that Europe may be Europe without Greece and Italy or whatever. It's ridiculous, just ridiculous. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm not a politician, but anyway. Um, no, it's not, a, it's not a sea. This is not a sea. This is a consommé. It's a consommé of cultures. Look carefully. On this sea, you can see culture coming in the last 20 centuries, maybe more than that. Culture from the north, from the east, oriental, African, Spanish, everything has been here. Of course, those two countries, Italy and Greece, are places of civilization. 
because they will they have been for centuries centuries thousand years in the center of the Mediterranean Sea for the good and for the bad and of course they are necessarily place of civilization and poetry this is very funny you know this is what I, w I saw Monday last Monday when I w when I watch out from my office in Geneva that was Monday last Monday that was Tuesday that was Wednesday Thursday not much different but very different that was Friday well, you may be you may find funny this but it's not that funny it's absolutely essential that was Saturday that was Sunday <laughs> that's that <laughs> I shouldn't show this I mean but anyway that's what they do that mean that what I what I mean is that I see, I watch sea all the time, but also I love to be in the sea, in the sea. And uh, you know, in some way, it's inevitable, inevitable to talk about beauty. This is beauty, because Mediterranean Sea is something linking us all together. It's our little internet in some way. And, um, and, and of course, this water is not water, it's a recording machine. If you look carefully, this water has been recording for centuries many, many things. Sounds, voices, perfumes, light, color, vibration, everything is there. History. It's a beauty. It's a pure beauty. It's a beauty that collects everything. And it's a beauty that is also sustainable. I don't know in what sense, in philosophical sense, you may say, but in sense of, of lightness, in sense of belonging to nature. You know, what kind of beauty we talk about, by the way, because, of course, beauty is something unreachable. I know very well. Sometimes you get to the door of the temple, but you never get in the temple. It's impossible. Beauty is something you should not, not even nominate, because it goes away. Like those are a few things that you cannot talk about, like silence. You don't call for silence, it goes away. Beauty is like that. It's unreachable. Unless, unless you think about special kind of beauty. That is the one that this country knows very well. You know, you know better than me, but elected people in Athens in the past were used to make a very short speech at the election day. The speech was very simple. I promise you, people of Athens, to give you Athens back more beautiful than you gave to me. End of speech. <laughs> and uh, I find great, great. This is something great. Because it's not just beautiful, it's also good. Of course, you know Greek better than me, but kalos kagatsos doesn't mean just beautiful. It's beautiful and good. They come together. And when beauty is this, it's different, because then beauty is knowledge, is understanding. It's, uh, it's knowing, it's searching, exploring. Of course it's art, of course it's music, of course it's uh, filmmaking and reading, but it's also education. That's beauty. And this is a beauty that we can reach. This is a beauty that belongs to us. And this is the beauty that makes people better people. This beauty switch on special light in the eyes of people. That's absolutely clear. They become better people. And of course, making place for people, making building for people, maybe making public building. I, you know, I love making building, that's for sure. That's my job. But I especially love to make public building. And the reason is very simple, because public building are place for people, that's all. There are places where people come together, they stay together, they share values. Even fear disappears sometimes in this sense of community. That's a great sensation. Place for people, public building, cultural building, I can say, make cities better place to live, for sure. So that's why 
I think beauty is not just a romantic idea. It's a very intense idea. I think beauty is probably one of the few emotions that can compete with other much more dangerous emotions, like victory, like fight, like money, like power. Beauty is intense at one condition, that is that beauty. It's not kind of metaphysical. It's something that belongs to us. And this beauty will save the world. I'm pretty sure about that. It will do it one person by a time, but it will do it. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. And please switch off the air conditioning. <laughs> Thank you. How can you go on after that? You say you're a, an architect and a builder, but I say you're a poet as well, and a very talented one. Thank you. Um, next one up. Uh, we have our next plenary session, and it's, uh, it's on sustainable health and food systems, and we have a panel of, again, some very, very exceptional speakers. But to introduce the panel, I would like to invite our very own Stelios Vasilakis, the panel moderator. Thank you.
great architect too. So. We have to turn this on or it turn? Okay. No. From here. Victor. I think they're on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final panel of the first day. And I hope it will be a great one. We have certainly a great slate of speakers. The panel is on sustainable health and food systems. And the way the panel will run is we'll have each one of the speakers going up to the podium and delivering a short presentation. And then we will have a conversation following the presentations and we will open the panel to the floor for any questions that there may be. So we will start right away. Uh, and I'm honored and pleased to introduce the first speaker, Ruth Faden, Andreas Sidrakopoulos Director, John Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? I'm kind of short relative to the previous speakers. I need to move this down. Let me just take a minute to thank uh, everyone at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for this incredible honor and opportunity for giving us this meeting, and perhaps most importantly, for everything that the foundation does in Greece and around the globe to make the world a better place honor to be associated in any way with this foundation. So by background, I'm an ethicist. I do work in bioethics. I come from a long tradition of exploring some of the toughest issues in biomedicine. We've worked on questions that seemed unsolvable. When is it acceptable to do medical research on children? What criteria should determine death so we can know when it's permissible to harvest organs? Should we force people to be tested for HIV or treated for TB? Now we are at a time in history when we must confront similarly challenging issues in food and agriculture. New technologies, climate change, and rapidly growing populations are compelling us to ask, how can we feed the world in a way that is sustainable? And that's another way of asking, how can we feed the world in a way that is ethical? Let's see. Sustainability, whether for the environment, the economy, or our communities, is at its core an ethics concept. Because it requires us to attend not only to our own needs, but also to the needs of future generations, sustainability is a commitment to intergenerational justice, to justice between our generation, the next generation, and the generation after that. But the path to sustainability is rarely ethically straightforward. Consider global food security. By 2050, there may be more than 9.5 billion people on Earth. Assuring that everyone, everyone in the world, now and in the future, has enough food to eat is an unassailable ethical imperative. 
But it's not enough just to know that our aim is ethical. We also need to be sure that every step, every step we take towards that aim is also executed ethically. As we make choices about which approaches to pursue and which technologies and policies to invest in, we have to continuously ask a basic ethics question. We have to continuously ask who will benefit and who will lose now as well as in the future because there will be winners and there will be losers. We have to continuously ask how the least among us will fare as a consequence of the decisions we take. Consider, for example, the issue of farming and its contribution to climate change. Today, farming and its related land use contribute up to one-fourth, one-fourth of the greenhouse gas emissions that drive climate change. One way to reduce this burden is to reduce the use of fertilizers, which are a major source of greenhouse gas. But here's the ethical problem. Disadvantaged farmers, many of them living in Africa and Asia, typically operate on small, very small tracts of land. These farmers are among the poorest, poorest people in the world, and their crop yields are already being compromised by climate change. They desperately need fertilizer to produce the meager harvests on which their families and their neighbors depend. Yet many argue that introducing more fertilizers to Africa will result in what we've seen in places like China, a massive overuse of fertilizer, which has significantly damaged the environment. So the ethics challenge is this. How should we distribute? How should we distribute the burdens of mitigating climate change? Is it right to ask the already so disadvantaged farmer to, for example, curb fertilizer in order to protect future generations? Is that the right thing to do? And if the answer to that question is no, then on whom in the agricultural sector should these burdens fall? Who should take up the slack if it's not to be distributed across all farming? Something to think about. The, global, the goal of the Global Food Ethics Initiative, which we are delighted has been supported by this extraordinary foundation, is to solve ethical challenges just like this one. We are working to build bridges between moral concerns and real world solutions, solutions that will allow us to feed the world ethically. The heart of the Global Food Ethics Initiative is an international working group comprised of experts in everything from climatology to, to developmental economics to human nutrition. Together, we've identified and prioritized over 200 specific ethical issues, specific ethical challenges that need to be tackled. We're talking about questions as perplexing and diverse as, and bear with me here, should we aim to replace meat on the hoof, meat as we know it, with meat grown in laboratories, so-called cell-engineered meat, because that would be much better for the environment, never mind what we would have for dinner. What values, are really, are, what values are really at stake in the debate about GMOs? What is really the core ethical concern here? And how far should we go to protect agrarian ways of life or natural landscapes as we seek to feed the world? We know that bringing ethical analysis to bear on complex societal challenges like these works because we've done it before. Responding to revelations of appalling research on human subjects, societies tackled the question of how to ethically conduct research in the 1970s. The keystone in that effort was a transformative document called the Belmont Report that laid out ethical principles and guidelines for human research. Today, the Belmont Report informs the ethics oversight of human research all over the world. Clear ethics guidance can change the way we move forward as a global society. It's been done in biomedicine, and it can be done in food and agriculture. 
The topics identified by the Global Food Ethics Initiative range from the welfare of farmers and farm workers to agricultural subsidies and free trade. We've identified seven specific projects on which we think real progress can be made within five years, what we call the seven by five agenda for ethics and global food security. One of our projects will take a hard look at climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture helps farmers and livestock producers to both adapt to a changing climate and reduce the impact of agriculture on climate change. For example, a new crop that produces fewer greenhouse gases would be climate smart. So are farming practices that help crops flourish with less water. Our goal, the goal of our project, is to make sure that climate smart strategies are not only smart, they're climate just. Technologies that small farmers can't afford or that can't be maintained in poor rural settings are not climate just. For example, there are handheld laser-based devices that help measure plant nutrition in ways that can spare the environment. The cost of this device is about 500 US dollars, which is rounding change for large-scale agriculture, but more money than some small track farmers will see in a year. And for subsistence farmers who are off the market grid altogether, this device is completely out of reach. Our project will develop concrete, practical criteria for assessing the fairness of proposed climate smart strategies. And we need everyone to be thinking, not only about climate smart, which is a very big focus for sustainability, sustainability but also about climate just. Beyond ensuring that climate smart is just, we need to be looking both upstream and downstream for ways to advance the ethics of global food security. So here's another set of issues to consider. The ethical challenges in the funding of agricultural research and development. We have a problem in agricultural R&D that is a less dramatic version of what used to be known as the 90-10 problem in global health where 90% of the world's burden of disease received only 10% of the world's health research investment. A 2012 report demonstrates the agricultural disparity in R&D. In 2008, wealthy countries spent $3 on research for every $100 farming generated for their economies. But low and middle income countries spent only about 50 cents for every $100. Moreover, countries devote the bulk of their agricultural R&D to needs at home. That matters because research on how to create increased crop yields, say for a large-scale farming operation in the US or Canada, doesn't easily transfer to small-scale vegetable farming in Greece or Uruguay, let alone to subsistence farming in Africa and Asia. The goal that we need to strive for is twofold. First, to identify which research priorities for global food security are ethically the most compelling. And second, to develop models of public-private partnerships and other investment strategies that can meet these unmet research needs. The goal would be to identify and incentivize the kind of R&D exemplified by the extraordinary work of Nobel Prize winner Norman Borlaug, who is credited with saving more than one billion people from starvation with his innovative work in the breeding of wheat. But not all ag R&D investments are as straightforward or as uncontroversial as that of uh, Dr. Borlaug's. Consider, for example, golden rice. Golden rice is engineered to deliver beta carotene and more recently other micronutrients as well. Vitamin A defici deficiency alone kills hundreds of thousands of small children annually. Many see golden rice as having high ethics payoff, but others object because it entails genetic modification. 
The, um, the Ag R&D Challenge reminds me of another parallel to biomedicine. In the 1980s, I and other colleagues in bioethics helped transform biomedical science from a primary focus on the biology and health needs of men to a focus on women as well as men. We need to ensure that, that producers and consumers who are more disadvantaged and less politically empowered in the ag sector also benefit fairly from the investments in ag R&D. We need essentially to introduce a consideration of who benefits and who loses right, by the investment decisions we make in the agricultural science sector. Finally, something else to think about, something that affects all of us, especially those of us with more purchasing power. When I go food shopping, and I actually go shopping a lot because I, I like to shop for food, I'm confronted with all kinds of labels, like organic, certified humane, or fair trade. Many of these labels are trustworthy, they're accurate, they're clear, but others are unreliable, and at worst, they're misleading. We need to develop a simple, comprehensive, global, label system, global labeling system for the ethics of food production that combines all of this information. We know the impact of consumer demand on the food production chain. Agribusiness will provide us what we want to buy. Clear labeling would empower individual consumers to help change the global food system based on our own values, whether that's environmental sustainability, animal welfare, labor standards, or food safety. Put another way, the goal should be to make it easy, easy, for each of us to contribute to making the global food system more ethical. Real sustainability can only be achieved by ethical means. And unless the benefits of sustainability are experienced fairly by all of us, including the least of us, the sustainability achieved will be both fragile and wrong. It's possible to be both climate smart and climate just. It's possible to make sure that the investments in R&D don't just benefit those who are already better off. It's possible for consumers equipped with clear information to shape our global food supply to reflect our values. It is possible to feed the world, and it is possible to do so ethically. Thank you. Sikas Phoebe Barron, Professor of Bioethics and Public Health, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you. Thank you, Stelios, and um, I'll also echo Ruth's thanks to the Niarchos Foundation for bringing us here and allowing all of us to have this important conversation. Um, so uh, I've been listening all day, and while the topic that I'm going to be addressing, which is more the sustainability of evidence from medical and health research, is a new topic, um, it seems to me in listening that there are certain themes I've heard all day that I'm going to echo. Um, one is that sometimes sustainability requires big ideas. Another is that sustainability sometimes only is going to happen if there's real systems change. Um, and the third is that sometimes sustainability and systems change only happen when there's real consumer demand. So with that, let me take us to another topic. So we have um, both as a world and from the country I come from in the United States, an extraordinary 
um, investment that we've made in the human health research enterprise. More than $250 billion are spent globally on health and medical research, and about half of that is spent in the United States. More than two and a half um, million, this is clearly a very uh, a low estimate, um, more than two and a half million people volunteer to join medical research as participants every year. And yet at the same time, there are estimates that from $750 billion to $1 trillion, which is from a third to a half of all medical expenditures, at least in the United States, are spent delivering medical care for which there is no evidence base. And this is comprised collectively of medical care that is unnecessary, incorrect, wasteful, or unproven. So let me draw your attention to a few of the blocks here on this slide. 37% of that waste is from unnecessary care. So that means trips to the doctor that were not needed, tests that were ordered that were not needed, surgeries that were recommended and performed that were not needed. 12%, the light blue, comes from unnecessary, um, oh sorry, from, from preventable conditions. So expenditures on things like pneumonia in older adults, where evidence says they should have had a pneumococcal vaccine, but it was never given. So 12% spent on preventable conditions, and 11% spent on medical mistakes, cleaning up after errors were made. The Institute of Medicine in the United States simply states, care that is important is often not delivered, and care that is delivered is often not important. So why is this lack of translation, this lack of sustainability, from those um, millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars spent on medical research. An ethics problem. Lots of reasons. When we ask human beings to enroll in our medical research, we make certain commitments to them. We say, if you are willing to volunteer of your time to sometimes take medical risks, we will do that so that the enterprise, so that medical care can improve. If the medical care doesn't improve, the premises under which we have invited people to join are not being met. Billions of dollars in both public and private money are invested in research that, again, in many cases, did not improve care. And then an additional set of money, additional billions of dollars, were avoidably spent on medical care that, again, was wasteful or harmful. Tens of thousands of people avoidably died from medical care that we should have known would have been either harmful or, again, was either not given when it needed to be or was given and turned out to be harmful. And all of these together, of course, add up to a profound justice problem. We are spending billions and billions of dollars on things that are not making enough difference or are being spent in the wrong place when millions of people desperately need medical care that we know would make a difference for them. So I'll go with this idea that maybe we have a systems problem. So our health care, we can imagine, is often given by our going to a clinic or a doctor's office or a hospital. At the same time, we often have a very separate system for medical research. Sometimes, literally, like in this illustration, it happens in another building. Even when it happens in the same building, it's generally led by different people. There are completely different staff. There are different sets of research nurses. And fundamentally, there are completely different databases. Now, this research system in a vacuum is actually highly efficient, often has some very high-quality people, and is highly productive. PubMed, which for those of us in, in my world of, of public health, medicine, health research, um, we will know that PubMed is our database of medical and health-related publications. So 2,300 new publications are added to PubMed daily. So imagine that there's a doctor or nurse over here in the hospital who wants to try to keep up with the evidence. 
and makes a commitment, a personal professional commitment, to read one of those articles every day. It would take that doctor or nurse between six and seven years to read the publications that came out today. And then imagine, of course, what happens with the rest of the year. And at the same time in this somewhat separate system, we have, again, particularly in my country, but seems to happen in many places throughout the globe, our doctors and nurses making their decisions in the context of most of their services being rewarded through financial gain. So every time they ask the patient to return for an extra visit, every time they order an additional test, every time they recommend surgery, there is both personal and for their organization, for their employer, reward from having made that recommendation. As a colleague of ours has said, most providers don't know how to move from volume, ordering more medical care, to value, getting quality with cost efficiency, without undermining their financials. So alternatives, and this is a quote I love, it comes from a very different context of when General Electric did their big business turnaround. From an analysis of that, someone said, you need a big idea to drive big change. So here's one of those big ideas for this context. Something that, again, the Institute of Medicine in the United States coined the learning healthcare system. So what does that mean? What do we mean by a learning healthcare system? So it means a couple of things where there's a very deliberate interplay. The first is that the best current evidence, you take those 2,300 papers and everything else that came out this year and last year and the year before, and patients and doctors and researchers together look at it to see where the evidence is incontrovertible and where it affects the highest priority of care, things like the pneumococcal vaccine for elderly people and the management of some very um, prevalent conditions. And that evidence is built into what are called clinical rules that affect how care is delivered there. The database, the system that doctors and nurses are using to deliver care is built in with algorithms that say, remember, this has to happen with this patient. And if something is ordered that ought not be done, a reminder come up, comes up that says, here's why you might want to rethink that. At the same time, when that medical care is given and data are entered through the patient's records, that data system is seamlessly capturing everything that's happening. It's capturing what the doctor ordered, it's capturing what the patient's symptoms were, and eventually it's capturing what the patient's outcomes were. And importantly, not only is this a seamless system where the data are generating the ideas and the rules, and the rules generate more data that informs and improves our next set of clinical rules, but it's happening on tens of thousands of patients, even within one given system, in contrast to perhaps 100 patients here, 100 patients here, and 100 patients there in different research studies. I hope it's obvious that there's, of course, another profound ethical underpinning to this kind of alternative system, to this kind of commitment. First of all, it's based on what I hope can be just an assumption of the way healthcare should work, that the primary commitment is to quality of care. The clinical rules are based on what we know improves the quality or quantity of patients' lives. It also makes a commitment to honoring patient choice, to furthering patient dignity in key areas where that becomes so important. And then third, when you have those two, when all of that happens, justice will be promoted through efficiency, through quality, and through the product of implementing those rules. So let me just give two much smaller examples, not of an entire health system by any means, but two micro-level examples where these kinds of big ideas have been put in place. The first is from pediatric oncology in the United States. And for some reason, 25 years ago, Cancer doctors who take care of kids in the United States got together and said, we need to make progress. And the only way to make progress is to keep track of what we're doing and figure out with every kid who gets cancer care whether what we're doing is making kids better or not making kids better. A commitment came about that most kids are entered into a clinical trial, and the kids who don't go into a clinical trial still have their data captured by the system that keeps track of what works and what doesn't work. 
And moreover, because everybody's part of the loop thinking about this evidence, the normal care, what you'd call the control arm of a clinical trial, or the care given to the kids where the families don't want to go into a clinical trial, is informed by evidence in a way that we don't see in, the rest, in most of the rest of medical care, in most of our settings, at least in my country. Another tiny little micro example um, I'll, I'll share with you is happening at my institution, Johns Hopkins, where some colleagues of mine, I have absolutely nothing to do with this, but I think it's a pretty, uh, pretty cool idea. Um, some radiation oncologists and medical physicists got together and developed something called Oncospace. This is for people who have head and neck cancers. And all the patients who come in with this kind of tragic diagnosis, when they see their doctor, have the doctors enter their information just as a doctor would into the computer. The computer also keeps track of all of their symptoms, all of their scans from radiation oncology. And it goes into a database that is immediately retrievable. So that if a new patient comes in tomorrow with a little bit of an unusual kind of head or neck cancer, the doctor can query the system and say, of the 25 patients we have seen here in the last couple of years who had this, what kind of treatment did they get and what were their outcomes? And again, using data as a feedback loop to have clinical data become our database and use that database to inform giving the best and most evidence-based care. So the last idea is, and what if we not only changed a system but had patients demand a system? Because clearly, we have not reached that system in at least most of the medical care in my country and I think also throughout the world. So here's just one little anecdote. There's a gentleman named Joe Cantor who's now in his 90s, who when he was in his 70s got prostate cancer. Unfortunately, a pretty prevalent diagnosis. And he was a longtime businessman, a pretty wealthy gentleman. And he went to his doctors and they said, well, you can either have surgery or you can do what we call watchful waiting, which means we'll keep an eye on you and see if we need to take any um, action. And he said, well, I'm a data guy. I always ran my business using data. Tell me what the data say, which is better. And they said, well, we're really not sure. Some people think this one's better. Some people think that's better. And he said, you've got to be kidding. Tens and tens of thousands of people get prostate cancer every year. And they said, sorry, we just don't really have the data. Again, the clinical data were not being used as part of the system. So he started a foundation devoted to capturing patient data for learning what patients need to know. The last example of patient demand I wanted to give, which again is just such a remarkable story, has nothing to do with healthcare. But it's the power of the people and how that can make a difference. So decades ago, when tragically a 13-year-old girl was killed by a drunk driver, a mother, as she, say, as she said, got mad and started this organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. She created action out of tragedy. It changed policy. And really importantly, for so much of this sustainability conversation, and certainly this piece I'm discussing, reshaped the public's view of what normal should be. We grow so accustomed to our present normal that we sometimes don't question that a different normal would be better. So she helped change the public view of what was acceptable or normal behavior, certainly in terms of whether somebody who'd had a few drinks ought to get behind the wheel of a car. As they say in their own documents of their history, MAD stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with politicians who knew the statistics but did not act. They took on a powerful industry that put profit over safety. They challenged a society that viewed drinking and driving as acceptable. What if patients similarly stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with those who viewed healthcare waste and medical error as inevitable or acceptable? What if patients demanded healthcare, a healthcare system that learned as it went and improved as it learned? Thank you. Our next speaker is Theo Zaoudis, Professor of Pediatrics, Chief Division of Infectious Diseases, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He will be speaking on sustainable quality improvement in healthcare. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. Thank you to the Nyakos Foundation for including me in this panel today. And I'm going to take this down to a different level, a more micro level, 
Um, and I appreciate uh, Nancy's comments because I think they clearly relate to what I'm going to tell you about today in the few minutes that I have with you. I really want to talk about quality improvement in healthcare and how, what are some of the principles, the general principles we need to apply in order to improve quality, in order to take the evidence base that Nancy talked about and apply it to the healthcare setting and to healthcare systems. I'm going to talk about a micro example from some of the work that's being supported by the foundation in, work, in Greece around quality improvement in one specific area. So how do we strengthen our health care systems? Um, we want to um, pr do performance assessment. And again, it, this is a great um, opportunity to follow the previous speaker and talk about developing measures and indicators. I think she was implying a lot we need data. And the children's oncology group and other groups collect data. And with that data, they set up measurements and indicators. And then once you've set up those measurement and indicators, you can define what are the high criteria, high performance criteria for your system, whether it be local, national, or global. And of course, you need to have a mechanism to report on those metrics and indicators and on performance. How else do we improve health care? We integrate the care. We want to reduce hospitalizations. Hospitals are not the most efficient and effective places to uh, deliver care. We have to think about breaking down silos between the hospital and the community. There are uh, interesting uses of telemedicine being applied now globally um, to deliver uh, uh, care and deliver specialty care or care that's not available in one region or another to another region. Um, quality of care um, includes patient safety and doing what's right for our patients. The, the science of uh, quality improvement is very well recognized. There's a powerful me methodology on how we can improve clinical outcomes and, and pay to patient satisfaction. And when we do that, we will reduce inefficiencies and costs. This is the plan, do, study, act cycle. It's a model for planning implementing, evaluating the changes in the system of care. And I'm going to talk about one specific example today, infection prevention, because I think it's been used traditionally to, to be a model, and it may be an ideal model um, for quality improvement work. Um, we founded something called the CLIO Initiative with the support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation in 2011, and it's really a quality improvement initiative, and we focused on two uh, major areas, the prevention of healthcare-acquired infections and antimicrobial resistance. And I know those two topics are probably not as familiar to you as some of the other things you've heard about today, uh, food safety, global warming, climate change, et cetera, but I really want to make a pitch and every time I get this opportunity to talk, I try to talk about how important this under, what I perceive to be an underrecognized problem is. Um, I'm going to talk about the problem in Greece specifically, but you could scale these numbers up um, across the, the developed um, and developing world. 10% of hospitalized patients in Greece develop a hospital-acquired infection, an infection that occur, occurs during the delivery of care. Many of these infections are due to um, bacteria, that are resistant to antibiotics. In Greece, there are 3,000 deaths per year uh, due to hospital-acquired infections. You could ec extrapolate those numbers um, uh, throughout the world. In aggregate, the cost of the Greek healthcare system is over 1.2 billion euros. So talking about a financial crisis, wouldn't we love to have 1.2 billion euros? Your next question is, well, can we have those 1.2 billion euros? And I would argue we can. The issue with healthcare acquired infections is they're almost completely preventable. And like Nancy said about applying evidence, I think applying evidence that we already know, these are, da these are facts, knowledge that we already have from the existing evidence base. And there's been success stories around this uh, in the United States and in other countries. Why antibiotic resistance? Why do we, we, should we care? CDC described the resist antibiotic resistance as one of the world's most pressing health problems. The WHO has identified antibiotic resistance as one of the three, you haven't heard about them today, right? This is one of the three um, greatest threats to human health. 
Antibiotic resistance kills 25,000 Europeans per year, 23,000 Americans per year, and the costs to the healthcare system are staggering. I want to show you this slide because I think I re really should bring home the message of why we should care about this problem. These are the deaths attributable to antibiotic resistance every year, and I want to show you what the projections are. This is from a report from the British government. In 2050, the number of deaths attributable to this will be 10 million. It exceeds measles, diarrhea, diabetes, cholera, and yes, cancer. The total GDP loss projected to be in 2050 due to antimicrobial resistance is $100.2 trillion. Taking it back to the micro level, what did we try to do uh, in Greece around this problem? And we tried to target several areas that are known um, to be effective in preventing these infections by these antibiotic resistant organisms. Simple things like hand hygiene, washing your hands, still the most effective way to reduce these infections. Preventing bloodstream infections in, in children and adults in the hospitals in, in Greece. And overall improving the use of antibiotics. Uh, and I'm going to give you just some examples. I mentioned earlier this plan, do, study, act cycle where you plan, you define the who, what, where, how, and how long, and include data from both outcomes and process measurements. On a small scale, and I think this is important, especially when you're starting at a grassroots level, um, have a prompt assessment of the effect of these changes, measure the effect, and then act on the results. What you need to do some of this work is some expertise, really good communication with all stakeholders in the healthcare system, those who are interested in quality improvement work. Data, data, data. You need data to inform both the process, the knowledge, and one of the things that uh, one of my mentors said is just pick something and measure it. It doesn't matter what it is necessarily, but measure it and measure it accurately. And then have full transparency about the data. Everybody needs to be willing to share this information. My hospital with your hospital, my hospital with Johns Hopkins, the United States with Greece, Germany with Greece, et cetera. How we apply this, just a simple example, we collected data before just to inform what was the current practice, what was going on in the hospital around antibiotic use. This was at one of the children's hospitals in Athens. We collected the data. We went to the stakeholders and said, here's your data. They didn't believe that that's what they were actually doing. The evidence base that Nancy talked about was there, but they still were not applying it. We intervened. We worked with them and said, let's make some changes. And then after the intervention, showed them the data again. We presented the results of our study to medical and nursing staff. We created training courses, notified people of what international guidelines and what the evidence base around this problem was. We adopted international guidelines. And um, we supervised um, physicians and uh, highlighted, I sort of not, should not have used the word mistakes here, but highlighted growth opportunities or areas for improvement. And this should speak for itself. This is, these are the numbers of antibiotic use, appropriate antibiotic use before our quality improvement initiative. And here's what happened afterwards. Really uh, striking results. How do you take something like this, though? Because the big question is, yes, this is a microsystem. It's a micro example. How do you take this and scale it up? Um, you take similar projects and implement them in a number of hospitals and a number of healthcare settings. And you can create a, make this part of a coordinated initiative at either at national or regional level. level. Um, this can then become a model for inter-hospital comparisons and benchmarking. Each hospital gets to know what the other hospital is doing, and they actually will drive change just by knowing where they stand compared to the other institution. Eventually, what you hope these efforts, when they come together, do is will enhance the development of national and regional assessments of the quality of care, and therefore getting back to applying that evidence base uh, that Nancy uh, talked about earlier. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Teresa Walters. She's the Director, Sustainability and Health System Strengthening, the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. She will be speaking on advancing a, na a nationally owned and sustainable HIV response. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Stelios. And um, let me begin by echoing what others have said and thanking you and the foundation so much for, for having me and the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation here at this event. We are absolutely delighted to be a part of this conversation. So in the HIV response, sustainability is so key due to the nature of the HIV virus and the way in which we treat the virus. Until we have a cure, Ending AIDS will require that millions of people around the world be on HIV treatment every day for the rest of their lives. Therefore, it's not enough for us to rapidly scale up HIV services, but at each step, we have to ask ourselves how these systems and services will be sustained and continually improved for years and years to come. If we don't, we run the risk of patients falling off of life-saving treatment. So I'll touch briefly this afternoon on some approaches that will support us to advance a sustainable HIV response, particularly in parts of the world most severely impacted by the epidemic. But first, I'd like to give you some context on the HIV epidemic and the response. There are currently 35 million people worldwide living with HIV. 78% of them live in Sub-Saharan Africa. 91% of them are children living in Sub-Saharan Africa. And 73% of AIDS-related deaths are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Since the, de since the epidemic started three decades ago, over 39 million people have died of the virus. Over the last decade, extraordinary progress has been made to scale up access to HIV treatment to 13.6 million people. Just 10 years ago, access to HIV prevention, testing, and treatment in low resource settings simply didn't exist for millions and millions of people. So this is really extraordinary. But the AIDS emergency is not over. The AIDS epidemic is not over. Today, 63% of adults with HIV are not on treatment. Three out of every four children with HIV are not on treatment. And 50% of HIV-infected children will die by the age of two years without treatment. That number increases to 80% of HIV-infected children by the time they reach five years of age. As has happened in the last decade, the global community has once again come together to advance an appropriately ambitious goal of ending AIDS by 2030. Achieving the end of AIDS by 2030 is predicated on an important formula known as 90-90-90. That means that by 2020, so five years from now, 90% of people living with HIV will be diagnosed and know their status. 90% of those individuals with HIV will be on treatment. And 90% of those on treatment will be virally suppressed. To reach 90-90-90, we need to increase the number of people currently on treatment by 110% in the next five years. So that means we need to go from 13.6 million people on treatment to 28.4 million people on treatment in five years. So this really brings us to a very critical question, and that is, how do we do this? How do we advance and sustain the scale up of high quality HIV services needed to achieve a 110% increase in people on treatment particularly in low resource settings like Sub-Saharan Africa. How do we effectively, as a global HIV response, support the country's hardest hit to build and sustain a national response? A sustainable HIV response must be nationally owned. 
Ultimately, countries, and particularly those most impacted by the epidemic, need the national capacity to support a long-term, high-quality HIV response. In the longer term, this will include financing the response. However, in the near and midterm, particularly for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, they will require external donor assistance to continue to support the HIV response. A multi-stakeholder, nationally owned response will include the contributions of the public health system at the national and decentralized levels, private health care providers, civil society organizations at a variety of levels, the private sector, and most critically, engaged communities and patients. So I'll touch on just two, two of these areas, the public health system and civil society organizations. In sub-Saharan Africa, health systems are already overburdened and have chronic shortages of health workers, commodities, and resources. For health systems to add millions more patients onto treatment for the rest of their lives, we have to strengthen health systems with a particular lens towards increasing cost effectiveness, making services more accessible and convenient for patients, and identifying greater efficiencies in service delivery. So I've listed here a variety of health system strengthening approaches that will be critical to advancing 909090. And I'll give just a couple of examples. By decentralizing HIV services to lower level health facilities and community levels, and by integrating services into other healthcare services, we can increase the number of individuals that access testing, prevention, and treatment services, and better retain patients into care and treatment. Evidence that we have from Zimbabwe demonstrated a nearly 50% increase in patients retained at lower level health facilities when compared to patients in services at larger regional hospitals. Decentralized services, particularly those at the community level, are also more cost effective and cost less for healthcare providers and for patients, which is particularly critical for individuals living on a dollar or two dollars a day in low resource settings. Effectively decentralizing services also requires that lower level facilities are equipped to diagnose HIV and monitor patients' viral load in a timely manner. The introduction of recently developed point of care technologies will allow us to test and initiate patients on treatment significantly faster, particularly infants, and soon we will have the capacity to monitor viral load at the lower level facilities and at the community level. One point I would just add on this, in Western countries where we have access to very good healthcare, the idea of point of care technology and the necessity of that may not seem entirely apparent, but in many low resource settings, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, there are only lab capabilities in one or two facilities throughout the entire country, which means that all samples have to be sent to a national laboratory and then returned to the patient at the facility. That process can often be several weeks, if not months, if it happens at all. And that's why point of care technology will be particularly critical in helping us to address some of the challenges we have um, currently in diagnosing and treating patients. Next month, uh, the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, with funding from Unitaid, is going to be launching and scaling up the largest ever initiative to introduce point of care early infant diagnosis in nine countries in Africa. And we think that this will be an absolute game changer for infants infected by pediatric HIV. We estimate that through this one project, we'll be able to save the lives of about 35,000 infants by initiating them more rapidly on treatment. Um, and last, oh, apologies. And lastly, uh, as most countries in sub-Saharan Africa have only a small fraction of the health workers they need, particularly physicians and other specialized workers, shifting tasks from one cadre to trained lower level cadres can help us to safely scale up access to HIV services while we await the resources to hire additional health workers. 
For example, several countries have implemented policies allowing trained nurses to initiate patients on treatment rather than doctors. And a large South African study demonstrated no difference in patient care for those patients initiated on treatment by nurses as opposed to doctors. So as a next step, we now need to think about how we introduce task shifting policies which will shift tasks from nurses to other lower level cadres such as lay counselors. National civil society organizations also have a critical role in the HIV response. They advocate for patient-centered policies, they provide HIV services, they support underrepresented populations such as children, women, gay individuals, and they provide assistance to strengthen government systems amongst other areas. However, in most low resource settings, and particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, civil society organizations need additional support and capacity to play these key roles in a sustainable way. To do this, civil society organizations require comprehensive capacity in a variety of institutional areas, such as governance, financial management, human resources, legal compliance, and data use, in addition to technical and programmatic areas. At EGPATH, one of the ways in which we are working to strengthen national civil society organizations is through our affiliation model. And EGPATH launched back in 2012 three national and independent organizations in Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, and Tanzania. And we did this by quite literally transferring and adapting the expertise, systems, and processes that we have established over 25 years as an international organization to these national organizations. Our affiliated organizations, which are governed by wholly independent boards and staffed by highly qualified nationals, benefit from access to EGPAF's technical assistance and institutional resources, which thereby allows them to tap into multi-country expertise and approaches and then adapt these approaches to their country context. So in 2011, as part of our commitment to advancing a nationally owned HIV response, we transitioned our programs and our funding at 575 health facilities in Cote d'Ivoire, Mozambique, and Tanzania to these national affiliates, and we continue to provide technical assistance to them in the last four years. Over these four years, these organizations, EGPAHI in Tanzania, Fundacion Ariel in Cote d'Ivoire and Fundasau Ariel in Mozambique have grown to be three of the largest and most effective implementing partners in country. They collectively, as of today, support more than 10% of all of the patients on treatment in those three countries, and they have annual operating budgets which have been verified through independent external audits of over $40 million. So our affiliation model and the successes of these three national organizations are just one example of the impact that civil society organizations can have when they have the comprehensive capacity and donor funding and time that is needed to support the national response. So as I mentioned earlier, the AIDS epidemic is not over, but for the first time, we have a roadmap in 90 that puts an AIDS-free generation firmly within our grasp. We have the drugs and we have the know-how. What we need is a sustained commitment and the requisite financing to continue to invest in what we know can lead us to the end of this epidemic. And thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Jeffrey Kahn, Professor of Bioethics and Public Policy, John Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. He will be speaking on sustainable public health, ethics infrastructure, and guidance following epidemics. Thank you. Thank you, Celios, and uh, thank you to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for the invitation. Again, to echo my colleagues. We'll say, having been here last year and seeing the transformation of the cultural center from uh, last year to this, 
that the contributions of the foundation are, are truly transformative and uh, I applaud what you're doing here and elsewhere. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, an area where uh, my colleagues and I at the Berman Institute, including Nancy Cass, are really uh, in a kind of a speculative mode. We're thinking about a, a project and the issues that need to be addressed. So we're sort of moving from projects that are underway to uh, other infectious disease related issues to one which you'll hear about related to epidemics. So as I'm sure you know, but let me just reiterate a little bit here, infectious disease poses significant public health challenges worldwide, remaining, uh, unfortunately, a leading cause of death among uh, children and adolescents. Even though we've had many uh, successes in the area of public health over the, the preceding decades, three of the top 10 diseases uh, remain uh, from infectious disease, and the burden of those diseases is disproportionately experienced by those in low and middle income countries, so much as um, Teresa was describing. We know, too, uh, from recent experience that emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases pose particular types of challenges. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the ethics infrastructure challenges as, as it relates to responses to those kinds of, of diseases and the issues they raise. So to talk about that, uh, we're actually proposing to carry out a project to learn from the experience of Ebola in West Africa. So a project not yet underway, but one that we're um, hoping to be able to carry out starting in this fall. Let me talk a little bit first about how uh, the public health ethics uh, infrastructure, or the way we think about public health ethics, responds to infectious diseases. So, Unfortunately, we have to think about infringing on uh, individual liberty when it comes to public health, and in particular, when there are outbreaks of things like infectious diseases. And of course, infringement on individual liberty, on limiting people's ability to move, do the things that they want, uh, go the places they want, see the people they want, uh, is a fundamental issue for all of public health. We, we impose those restrictions primarily when the concerns that we have are about individuals posing risk to others. So we have to ask ourselves in the context of a particular example, how great must the risk to others be before we infringe on individual liberty? How significantly other affecting might those risks be? And how much infringement on individuals is justified? Now when we consider the implementation of such restrictions, we actually turn to principles that were um, pioneered by my colleague Nancy Cass and uh, worked on, I think, uh, included by uh, Ruth Faden and, and other colleagues at the Berman Institute and myself and others in the bioethics community. So we ask ourselves, are the proposed restrictions necessary to achieve the stated public health goal? Do they get us what we want? Will they be effective at achieving those goals? Are the restrictions proportional to the goals that will be achieved? Are they the least infringing ways possible to achieve those goals? And are they publicly justified? And I may add another at the end of the talk, as you'll see. So this kind of basic public health ethics infrastructure has been with us for a little while now. And it gets challenged every time we confront a, a new or maybe a, a very difficult public health ethics situation. And we have to ask ourselves how to respond in terms of individual and group limitations of liberty when it comes to outbreaks like the recently experienced Ebola outbreak in West Africa. So to remind you and us all, here's some information from that outbreak. A little hard to see, but the bottom line is the total uh, number of cases suspected, probable, and confirmed in the countries of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and this is data from April of this year, uh, the total number in that com combined categories is 25,831. The total number of deaths is 10,659. So depending on how many of those expect, uh, probable or expected cases that were actually confirmed, it's, still, it's a very high death rate. And we, we worry, of course, here's a, a blown up map of the countries that are most uh, hard affected. The darker the orange, the largest number of cases. So you see the hardest hit countries were Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea. 
So I want to spend a few minutes talking about some features of the outbreak in Liberia in particular. And for this information, I uh, owe a debt of thanks to uh, uh, a colleague and new friend of ours who came to spend a month with us at the Berman Institute uh, named Nelson Dunbar, who is the director of research in the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare in the country of Liberia. So he was really at the, uh, at the point of trying to help stem the outbreak of Ebola in his country. And he, he uh, was with us for the last month, and much of what you'll hear from me now comes from his personal observation. So this is more a kind of um, description of what happened during the Liberia outbreak, and we hope to learn more from some research that we will begin, we hope, in the fall. So there were some features that um, led to the spread of the disease and the difficulty in controlling the outbreak, which were first the denial of the existence of the disease by those who were confronted by it, including the government. A l therefore, a limited initial response by the government and the health infrastructure, which is, of course, already very limited. An existing lack of trust among the population in systems of healthcare delivery. So, Many of these countries already suffered from very difficult health systems uh, resource uh, wants anyway. They were already very stressed, and the systems that did exist were not very trusted by the population. So that, of course, added to the problems of um, the outbreak. Much of the care of individuals when they became sick happened in the home, whether it was medical care as we think about it or traditional care. And so that um, meant people were in contact with those who were infected. In addition, traditional burial practices meant lots of uh, handling of dead bodies by multiple people, which of course is a very easy way to spread the infection in the case of Ebola. And then lastly, poor engagement with the communities who were affected. As you'll see in a second, there were government actions, but they were mostly unilateral. They were imposed upon the community rather than discussed and, and come to as an agreed approach by the community and the government. So the responses by the government um, were quite extreme in many respects. So uh, think about the list of principles that I, I showed on an earlier slide. So you want to make sure that the response is necessary. Will it achieve the goal you want? Is it proportional? Is it publicly justified? So among the government's responses were to immediately close schools, which meant there wouldn't be an ability of, of uh, children to interact with each other, but of course it meant there weren't schools to attend. Borders were closed between countries, although these are very porous borders to start with, so that's a quite difficult thing to do. Checkpoints were erected within countries to, to limit um, people moving from place to place, spreading the disease. Some um, communities were actually quarantined so uh, public health approach is called cordon sanitaire, so actually closing off communities so that no one could go in or out as a way of preventing the spread of disease where there was known infection. Of course, that creates all sorts of problems for things like access to food, uh, people's ability to go to work, uh, children couldn't go to school anyway, but, but panic starts to ensue. There was closure of airports and a shutting down of air travel to prevent spread of disease in or mostly out. And an order by the government to cremate all bodies that were suspected Ebola deaths. And then it turned out that all deaths were considered suspected cases of Ebola. So effectively a, a mandate that all dead bodies would be cremated, which was contrary to the burial practices uh, of the communities involved. So telling people to do things that had been um, carried out when a loved one died over the course of centuries and millennia. Stop doing that and now cremate everybody very difficult to make that happen. So all of these taken together exacerbated some, exacerbated some of the existing challenges, especially given the reports we heard uh, of limited community discussion. So this was really imposed upon people rather than something they, they learned about after discussing it and, and coming to a shared conclusion. So maybe on a brighter note, as you know, the um, outbreak was stemmed earlier this spring. Um, Liberia has reported no new uh, Ebola cases within the WHO defined a number of days to be, clear, to be declared Ebola free. 
And so coming again from Nelson Dunbar, some um, observations about what worked in the case of Liberia's response when they um, were able to turn the tide. One was political leadership, so people making difficult decisions about what to do. Global support, and that was both money, moral support, so saying you're doing the right thing, and also sending experts and expertise, with expertise, to spend time in the country. One of the things we heard was, um, it doesn't help to parachute people in who spend a couple of weeks and then leave, and then someone else comes two weeks later. We need people to come and stay and help us see through to the end of, of the um, outbreak. Access to daily information, so that might seem like an obvious thing, but collection of epidemiological data, not easy in a country like Liberia. So collection of data that fed back to the central authorities so they could understand what was happening in various parts of the country related to the outbreak was very important. And now to the point of my sort of sustainable ethics approaches. The community's willingness to change behavior. So in particular, Liberia, it turns out, they like to hug and shake hands and warmly greet each other, but that's not a good thing to do when you've got infectious disease spreading within your community. They were willing to not do that once they understood that that was a way to stop the spread of this deadly disease that was decimating many of their communities. They also willingly altered their traditional practices in relation to burial. So they, they understood, once it was explained to them, that this was the burial practices, which included washing and wrapping and passing dead bodies, was not uh, a way to stop the spread of disease, but rather was a way of making sure the disease would continue to spread. In addition, he noted that social mobilization, so getting the people who were involved in communities to talk to each other and engage and talk to the other members of their communities was key, along with this engagement I've been mentioning. And lastly, cross-border coordination among countries. So the, the, the borders are really lines on a map, and that's not the way that diseases behave. They don't pay attention to lines on a map. Here's a, a photo uh, of Red Cross workers in Guinea. This is not from Liberia, but this is just from um, this week, in fact. Red Cross volunteers working with community members in Guinea to teach good protection practices. So you see people standing and, and listening and learning from um, Red, Red Cross volunteers to help better understand what to do. So this took the form of face-to-face -face meetings, focus group discussion, and programs on the radio, and actually sketches on um, pieces of paper showing people um, what to do and what not to do. So really engaging the community as a way of embedding good practice and coming to conclusions that were shared in a way that would um, lead to sustainable good practice and prevent outbreaks from continuing and hopefully uh, slow their spread in the future. So what's next? So the, the project that we hope to carry out will work to do a few things. One is to better understand the concerns at the community level and the understanding at the community level of what's going on in an, about, in an outbreak of infectious disease like Ebola. To try to better understand the sources of mistrust in the government, in the, in the health infrastructure, and how best to confront those kinds of mistrust or those examples of mistrust. We will work from the data that we collect, so not quite the kind of data that Nancy and Theo were talking about, but the information we collect will be used to craft guidance to craft and then promote ethically acceptable practices when the next outbreak occurs. And of course, it's not a matter of if, but when the next outbreak occurs. And what will be ethically sustainable guidance and practice will be that that is owned by the communities who are themselves impacted. That seems to be the early lesson that we're hearing from those who experienced the, the, the Ebola outbreak, at least in Li Liberia. So we want to search for and help craft ethically appropriate and culturally acceptable restrictions and interventions. So going back to my earlier slide, we want to learn from those who were and are and will be affected by these outbreaks in the past and in the future. And we will discuss with diverse groups um, the issues that they see, the potential approaches to helping address those issues, and a, f uh, a framework that might help guide future responses. So we, we hope that that will create capacity for ethically acceptable responses for the next infectious disease epidemic outbreak. If we don't, we'll face more stories like this. So this is not about 
the outbreak, but this is about in the aftermath of the outbreak, vaccine trials that have been um, started to try to, to test, first develop and then test, a potential vaccine for the Ebola virus. You may have seen this news, again, this was this week before last, that one of the trials in Ghana was halted due to community protests, and it's too small for you to read, but one of the um, quotes there is from uh, members of a community who said, we don't want to be treated as guinea pigs. Leave us and don't do this research here. So that's a problem of the community not being engaged. So the take home, I think, for me, and I, I hope for others too, is that if we don't learn from this experience, not only in ethically acceptable approaches, but in what works and what doesn't in the context of public health, that uh, the next Ebola outbreak, we, we won't do better again. And this is a story from uh, Médecins Sans Frontières saying, we won't do any better unless we learn from what happened this last time. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. I, I have a few questions which I will ask them all together for, and then I will ask some of you to address. And then hopefully we can have a couple of minutes to um, open the floor for people from the audience to ask any questions they may have. Ruth, um, when we talk about food and sustainability, the idea of sustainable food, um, is very different for different parts of the world. So food means different things in Pakistan and in diff very different things mm -hmm. to a New York family. And it seems to me that when you talk about food and sustainability um, in New York, you are basically addressing an issue of well-being, uh, standard of living. It's, it's quite high. The choices there have to do with um, living well rather than anything else. And when you try to address the same issue to, in Pakistan, you are dealing with a completely different problem. It's an issue of sustenance, it's an issue of hunger. It's, it's very different. Is it possible to try to address the food issue and to try to address sustainability relating to food at a global level when you know, their competing interests and our understanding and our needs about food are very different at very different levels? Um, and then, can I ask the other oh, ones absolutely. as well? And then, and then um, I wanted to ask Nancy. There was a book published in, in the 90s called Publish or Paris. <laughs> and the book had to do basically with research and publishing in the humanities. In order basically, for those who know the US academic system, in order to get tenure in the US, you had to publish a lot. So people did that. Uh, in order to get tenure, and we ended up being swamped with material, esoteric material, that nobody ever read. And it was obviously a self-sustaining industry. You had to do that in order to, to get a job. And from what you described, it seems to me that some of it applies in the health sector as well. And in order to maintain a position at a top university, you have to bring grant money from the outside. You have to do research. You have to put a proposal together. You have to go out to pharmaceutical companies, perhaps, or other companies that can you know, finance your research. So um, many times, research becomes a vehicle to maintain your job, to maintain your position. And to me, it seems that it can lead to what you were describing, wasteful research. So um, how, can you address a problem that seems to be applying to the whole system? If the whole system it works exactly the same way, how can, is it possible to address it? Or can you break it down completely and start from scratch? And then to, to the rest of the panelists, um, it seems to me that both HIV AIDS and Ebola, um, the world reacted very late to it in the case of Africa. It took many, many years to realize that it was, in the case of Ebola, it was recently, but for HIV AIDS, it took a long, long time to realize how serious the, the problem was there and try to address it. And again here, I think we have a, an issue of approaching things very differently. When we deal with health issues in the developed world, we're talking about chronic conditions, it seems to me. I'm not a doctor, but from what I read. And then when you deal with uh, health issues in the developing world, let's say Africa, for example, 
you're dealing mainly with infectious diseases. That's the, the main problem there. And since, you know, money, resources available to treat these issues are rather scarce and, you know, becoming rather limited day by day, again, can you address these issues in a way that is effective and sustainable when we have completely different interests in our minds, when the system here is facing one problem and the system there is facing a completely different problem, but most of the funding that will help resolve the problem in the developing world comes from the developed one. That's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> no problem. Do you want me to start? Please. So I'm supposed to remember the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the problem. I do, I do remember it, actually. So uh, there's a way that uh, I can answer your question and challenge your premise at the okay. same time. It's, uh, it's certainly correct that in the near term, the health and well-being problems that wealthy countries face and wealthier people in less wealthy countries face with regard to food is different than the health needs that are related to food of the very poor. So we have two billion people in the world who are either overnourished, that is to say they're either obese, or they're undernourished in terms of micro micronutrients. Sometimes they're the same people, but the solutions and the strategies are very different depending on the part of the world that you're in. That said, global food security is like climate change. We, we cannot really address it as a society in a sustainable way any way other than as one global community. I'll give you two examples. Uh, right now, uh, we are struggling with the recognition that one of the single biggest sources of greenhouse gases is actually the consumption of animal protein and dairy products. And that's because of the um, intensification and other kinds of, um, for, we can go into the details, but I won't. Trust me, it's a very big source of climate change challenge. And there are predictions that even the best of technology and the best improvements in farming practices will not get us to a, an acceptable uh, change in the acceleration of climate change. We're going to have to eat less meat. There's, there's really no way around it, according to the I best predictions. Any, and we're going to have a wonderful dinner tonight. I don't want to inhibit anybody's food choices <laughs> as I bring this up. Most of the meat consumption currently is among the world's wealthier people, yeah. right? So if we're going to have a sustainable environment, right, and we're going to have a sort of secure global food source, we're going to have to think about how we're going to distribute the responsibility to reduce, reduce meat consumption. And it can't be um, something that we tackle one country at a time. There's also a tremendous uh, increasing shortage of arable land in the world, which climate change is creating. That is to say, land where it's possible to grow food. And there are now movements on the part of some wealthier countries to actually purchase arable lands in other countries, right, where uh, land is sold off. Now, what that does is secure the food future, future for the people who live in these wealthier countries at the expense right, of the food security of the people who live in these poorer countries where there is a little bit of arable land left or maybe more arable land left. And so we have to struggle again uh, only as one global society to figure out as a matter of justice is this kind of um, allowing of the global capital marketplace permissible, and if it is in some way something that should be constrained, how in the world could we possibly do that? So I don't think global food security in the end is anything other than a global challenge needing uh, global solutions. Okay, thank you. So another great question, um, Stelios. So um, yes, I mean, it, it certainly is uh, the, the currency of academic environments that I'm part of, which are not humanities, they're more health, to get, to get grants and publish. I, I certainly think that people working in those environments, obviously there's exceptions, but for the most part have good intentions and want their work to be a means to an end. Don't see it as simply a way to get tenure and don't, don't see it themselves as simply a way to publish something interesting. But like with the 
um, incentives for healthcare often being to just do more whether or not it is valuable, sometimes the um, incentives aren't completely aligned to create the um, practice sustainability effect that we want. And um, I'll throw out sort of a couple ideas, but I imagine that we could collectively generate a lot more. Um, one is that um, research, uh, it, it, one big funder of research in the United States at least is the NIH. They actually are specifically forbidden to fund practice. Now it seems like a lot of research, and this obviously does not apply to very early stage research where you're really just testing ideas, but when you get to later stages, um, it seems to me that if the same people were charged with thinking about um, generating evidence and trying it out and seeing if it made a difference, the way people who do quality improvement for hospitals have to do, try, come up with the idea. I think X would make a difference in reducing infections. Put it into place. Get paid to put it in place. Measure if it makes a difference. Tweak it. Come up with a new idea. Put it in place again. If the entire cycle were funded, I think that we would have better and more relevant research and more effective um, uh, outcomes. Um, so I think sort of what funders choose to fund or say they can fund is, is one thing. Another piece, and I want to I want to I want to have a big caveat around this that I'll say in a minute, is where the ideas come from. So the first part of what I want to say is um, I don't know that we have enough cross-pollinization of discussion, even at the stage where researchers, even if all they're doing is research, are coming up with their ideas. If the people who were in the hospitals and clinics were the ones saying, boy, our top five lists for you guys to study are these things, then the research might be more relevant and might even be picked up naturally more often. Now, my big caveat is I don't want to do, I, I am a believer in ideas and creativity, and I don't want to get rid of a system that says people can just come up with ideas and run with them. But if that's the only way that people get their ideas, if there isn't this cross-pollinization from the people who are the end users, then why should we be surprised that there's not a perfect match? Thank you. How do you want to do it? Um. Go ahead. Okay, um, so it's, totally, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So in thinking about um, this tension that we have between donor funding, which is typically coming from, from Europe and the US going to developed countries, I think the, the critical element there to ensure that donors have a return on investment is collaboration. The ideas have to come from the countries themselves, from local partners themselves, from communities. And I think we've seen in, in countless examples um, across the development spectrum of when that hasn't happened and what the result has been. And one example um, in the HIV world that's come up in, in the last year, um, over the course of the last decade, the US government, um, who is one of the largest funders of, of the HIV response and contributes about 50% of all funding globally for HIV, would not fund um, certain prevention activities and focused instead on abstinence education. Yep. It was a policy that was made basically by people sitting in Washington who did not have any real world context. Um, there was evidence recently that came out that showed that basically it was an abysmal failure. There was literally nothing that came out of all of that funding. And so it's really critical early on that the funding that goes to these countries is based in a spirit of collaboration. There absolutely should, should still be accountability that doesn't take that away, but it needs to be more of a dialogue rather than priorities being pushed from, from the West into developing countries. Okay. So uh, I, I guess I would um, start a little bit earlier in the in the premise of your conversation, of your question, um, and say HIV in, in many parts of the world now is a chronic infection, a chronic disease. So we have uh, the medical community and the public health community has been successful in transforming many acute infectious diseases into chronic illnesses. Um, that said, the burden of acute infectious disease, no doubt, is um, disproportionately felt by the developing world. Um, when I was in public health school, and I'll tell you how long ago that was, in, in the mid-1980s, uh, a 
a representative from the US State Department came to a, a, a class I was taking in epidemiology and said, we're thinking about just pulling all funding resources out of parts of Africa with very high rates of HIV infection because it's just going to be a waste of money. That was in the mid 80s. We've seen a, a 180 degree turn in many respects since that time and a recognition that what happens in other parts of the world matters everywhere. Borders matter less. Airplanes can fly anywhere very quickly. Uh, and of course, we worry um, everywhere about pandemic flu that, that can travel very quickly around the world. So it's quite short-sighted to think about this as a, um, an us-then or north-south or east-west kind of, of problem. Um, that said, you know, there are different kinds of challenges that are faced in the developing world than there are in the developed world. And so Nancy's, Nancy's point was about a, it's a health systems problem, and, and that's true in the case of infectious disease as well, but it's a different health systems problem. And so I think that's part of what the lesson of the outbreak in West Africa most recently pointed out yet again, not that it was something people didn't know about, but a kind of acute point being made that the, the health infrastructure, the health systems were not sufficient to deal with these kinds of issues. And it's important for the world that, they, that there be a more robust ability to respond because what happens anywhere matters to people everywhere. We're right on time, so um, if there are any questions from the audience, I think this is a good time to ask our panelists. Please. Um, can we pass the mics around, identify yourself, and... Good afternoon, Ilias Pulias from the Pulias Foundation, Guatemala. Question for Ruth and Nancy. Ruth, you identified that you said there are around 200 ethical questions that you have. So when does the debate end and conclude and take action? And Nancy, you, you pose certain problems there. Yeah. We have the questions. So there's something that sustains this problem. There's a reason it's happening. There's a reason it doesn't work. What is it and how do we change it? I mean, you said that the patients should act and say, guys, we need to work these five things. But how does it actually happen? I don't think, I, I don't know if only it has to be patient side or mm -hmm. another step. Thank you. It's, there's, um, let, me, let me answer your question the way in the spirit in which you answered it. We identified, and this was through a complicated process, 200 specific ethical issues in food and agriculture that really need to be tackled. And then in the we is this group of, of um, almost 30 people, different disciplines from around the world. We then gave ourselves the following task. Of these 200, right, which ones are incredibly important, clearly ethical in their core nature, and about which something can be done in five years. That was really hard, the last one especially, about which something could be done in five years. So I think it is in the character of ethical questions of uh, grand nature that some are, if not completely intractable, very uh, resistant to resolution in the real world. But there are some right, where you can anticipate that progress could really be made. Either the disagreement can be narrowed, or the um, dilemma could be reshaped, or the ethical issue can be transformed in a way where you can actually move forward and allow whatever it is that is standing in the way to actually happen. So the example I gave about climate just and climate smart, we think that's a, a challenge that's tractable within five years. We actually think getting a global labeling system for ethics of food is tractable within five years. Not easy, but doable. So I appreciate your, your um question, and um, let me add a little more to what I said earlier, which is um, that health, people on the professional side 
can make an extraordinary difference to articulate a vision and put it in place. And there actually are some health systems, I apologize because I know, I know the US situation better, that's where I've been doing my work for the last couple of years on these issues, but um, there are three examples I'll throw out that are getting a lot of, I think, well-deserved um, attention. Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania, Group Health of Puget Sound in Washington State, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah, are all systems where at least one individual had a big idea and a vision and said, it's crazy that we're separating these things. When all of medicine is fee for service, the incentives are never gonna be aligned toward what makes the most sense for people. If it makes the most sense for you not to get surgery, we have to be rewarded for that rather than being rewarded for doing more surgeries. And people from the professional side who obviously have more power are, are already part of the system. Um, sometimes have created what are now very successful, both in terms of quality of care and in terms of financial outcomes, um, systems. What seems so challenging to me when it seems so crazy that we continue to do so much medicine that is not consistent with evidence. There's one study that said 55% of medical care is, is consistent with the evidence. Um, when it seems that crazy, I, I want to point out what some of the problems are and what some of the vision is for the solution. And I do think that patients may be the ones who are going to have to demand at the remaining places that the systems that, that are at big name places are not always serving all of their interests in the best ways and are certainly not serving the interests of the majority of the population. Bob? I'm Bob Goodman from the Rutgers School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. Uh, Ruth, I was very taken with the way you approached the topic this afternoon. But what you didn't get to is who pays for research and whether there's a lever there that needs to be operated in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a time where globally, really, domestically in the US, the CG system, many of the um, countries of Europe and, and the developing world are disinvesting in agricultural research. As agriculture becomes more global, the private sector is increasing, although even with that increase, not anywhere near sufficient money is being spent on agricultural research. So I guess I'm wondering if you would extend your comments to the operative side, which is who pays and who benefits, and how can we do a better job of making this a public good? Yeah, no, absolutely, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. We have to think about agricultural R&D as a public good, just as we think of biomedical research as a public good. Uh, and you'll have to forgive me because my analogies are all to biomedicine because that's where I began my career and now I'm, I'm focusing uh, a similar sort of justice lens uh, to the ag and food uh, territory. But we've got something, and you know better than I do, I suspect, we've got something like $62 billion um, in ag R&D um, at the moment, and most of that is uh, not going towards the ag uh, R&D needs of uh, low, um, resource poor countries, something like maybe two to three billion of that. Uh, we have some new philanthropic players. Uh, the Gates Foundation is investing more, uh, which is very, very wonderful. Uh, countries like China and Brazil and India are investing more in ag research, so we're seeing some public state investment, but they're much, uh, they're clearly focused on supporting ag research that's specific to their own agricultural sector uh, and, e and economic needs. Uh, we need, part, part of what we want to build into this initiative uh, and are eager uh, for, for people who've thought about this uh, to join us is um, a better balance, right, of public-private investment. Uh, there, are, there has been a pulling away uh, from public investment as private sector has come on and as global uh, food has become such a big um, agri-system business. And so that's part of what is making uh, it more difficult to get to the kind of uh, distribution of the benefits of ag science that we'd like to see. So I couldn't agree with you more about the need to think, rethink private public uh, proportional investments, the role of the philanthropic sector, and the role of, of uh, ag R&D as a public good. Yeah, 
και ονομάζομαι Βούλα Λίβα. Α, θα ήθελα μια ερώτηση. Ε, γιατί στην υποσαχάριο Αφρική εστιάζεται μόνο στο HIV και στον έμπολα και όχι στις λιμόδις νόσους που εκεί με εμβολιασμό θα μπορούσαν να ελεγχθούν και μαστίζουν όλη την, α, την περιοχή. Ευχαριστώ. Why in Sub-Saharan Africa the emphasis is on HIV, AIDS and Ebola and not to infectious diseases to vaccine, that can be vaccinated basically and address the problem uh, much more efficiently and much more effectively? Sure, that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, and there, there is in fact- Can somebody translate at that end? There is in fact an emphasis on, on both. Um, there have been vaccine trials ongoing, um, largely in, in the United States for, for HIV. The, the challenge that we have with, with both the vaccine and, and a cure ultimately is that those are longer term prospects. And so the, the focus has on a parallel process been how do we, until we have vaccine and cure, get as many people as we can identified and on lifelong treatment? Maybe the other thing to say too is there has been great success in um, vaccine preventable diseases in, in Africa and very high rates of, of vaccination for childhood um, infectious disease in, in many of those countries. In fact, some many parts of Africa have higher rates of, of vaccination than many parts of the United States at this point, which says more about the vaccine hesitancy going on in the US, but nonetheless, great success in reducing uh, deaths from preventable childhood infectious disease. The, the, the problem, of course, is there are not vaccines for HIV or Ebola yet. Do you want clickers? I think we've reached, oh, one more. Let's do this last one. Go ahead. Right there. Right there, right there behind you. Thank you. My name is Gabriel Müller from Light for the World from Austria. We are supported through, uh, uh, by Stavros Niachos Foundation uh, in prevention of blindness in sub-Saharan Africa. One question, uh, I do not know whether it's true or it's a myth. I know it from prevention of blindness this, that nutrition is an uh, 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 important fact to see whether treatment uh, is effective or not, or if the people are coming for treatment or not. Because when people come from remote areas in Ethiopia, for eye operation and for HIV it's similar, they have to care in the public health system for their own nutrition. And I do not know where, whether it's a, a myth or truth, I heard it from MSF, that the treatment with the antiretroviral medication needs three meals a day. And in Africa, it's absolutely clear that you never provide nutrition and medication, because if I die from nutrition, I better get HIV AIDS because then I get the medication and the nutrition. Is there a, a, a myth or is there truth behind that? Thank you. That's a great point. Um, there, there is absolutely truth behind that. And one of the challenges we have right now with the drugs that are available to treat HIV is that they are very powerful drugs and they, they have a lot of side effects. And so you do need to um, take them with food. Um, if not, people can get very sick from it. It's one of the challenges that we have, particularly when people still have a higher CD4 count and they don't feel sick yet, they don't have symptoms yet. If they are going through a point in time, for example, um, during the hunger seasons when, when households don't have as much to eat, they, they can feel very sick um, and have a lot of side effects from the drugs. That's why oftentimes what you'll see, particularly more recently, is um, HIV programs that are coupled with nutritional supplementation programs so that families will get drug as well as um, food to be able to take the, the drugs with. Okay. I think we've reached the end of the first day. I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank all the panelists uh, during this first day. I want to thank the audience for staying with us until the end.
and all those of you who did anyway. Um, we finished much earlier this time than last year. <laughs> we had to close the doors actually to keep you in. <laughs> but thank you, enjoy your evening, and we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.